I feel I ought to encourage you again to continue to reread Battling the Host of Hell. I believe that it will cause a renewed effectiveness in the attacks on the enemy. And uh, some of you have read it a long time ago. Some of you never did get to read the whole thing. I think if you'll go through it, you'll find some interesting things that you perhaps overlooked or have forgotten about. And I wrote the books, and I've read them about nine times a piece since I wrote them, since they've been printed. So every time I read them, I find something new that I remember, that I don't remember. And I think, wow, I'm glad I wrote that down because otherwise I wouldn't remember it. So don't hesitate to reread. God fixed those books like that just to make them useful. So I hope you will do that. Well, uh, anybody been through a storm lately? <laughs> Silly question. Uh, okay. Well, that's what the song is about, the reason I was asking. <clears throat> In the dark of the midnight have I all hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place mid the crash of the thunder precious lord hear my cry keep me safe till the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till those clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe storm passes by. Many times Satan whispered, there is no use to try, for there's no end to sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till those clouds roll forever from the sky, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When this long night has ended, the storms come no more let me stand in thy presence on that bright and peaceful shore in the land where the tempest never comes Lord may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky, oh we must let me stand in the hollow of my hand. 
to come a time when those storms are going to pass by once and for all. I'll tell you, I'll not have a single regret leaving here, will you? Praise the Lord. This whole earth's already used up, gone, kaput. And the only reason we're here is to serve Jesus and get other people saved and ready for the things that are coming. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. Let's see if we can find something in the Bible to talk about tonight. I looked and looked trying to find something. And over in Luke 7, I found the most interesting passage. Luke chapter 7. came to pass the day after, this is after the centurion's servant was healed, that he went in, and Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still and said, Young man, I say to thee, Arise. You know, he didn't even have to shonda my Honda or anything. He just said, Young man, I say, Arise. No magical passes, no abracadabra, just young man. I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. I'll tell you, wouldn't that be a great thing to be going to that funeral? Hear this funeral procession, a woman, her only son, grown man, he's dead. His mother's a widow. She has nobody to look after her. Her son now is gone, who was the one who would look after his mother. And now she's, he's uh, dead and evidently a very well-liked man and woman in the community for the much people of the city were with them at the funeral. And they were carrying this young man out to bury him. And Jesus met the funeral procession and broke it up. Praise God. You know, did you know we're going to a place where there's not going to be any more funeral processions? No more. No more graveyards, no more hearses, no more funeral, no more sad tears, no more parting over there. That's what the song says. It's coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, no more parting over there. It's coming a time when that's not going to be, we're not going to part from those that we love. Now we have to part. Sometimes for a season, and then sometimes death takes them away, and there's a more permanent parting until the time that we see them beyond the skies. But here, Jesus broke up the funeral and gave this young man back to his mother. And there came a fear on all. This is a godly fear. The fear of the Lord is clean. This is a godly reverence, a great hush and awe and stillness came over their souls, their minds, will, and emotions were wrapped up in awe and wonder at what God had done. And there came a great fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen among us, and God, and then they also were saying, God has visited his people. God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea, throughout all the region about and the disciples of John, John the Baptist, showed him all the, of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, his learners, sent to Je them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and of many that were blind, he gave sight. He gave them a visual object lesson, audio visual lesson. And then Jesus said to them, go your way, tell John the things you've seen and heard. 
The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And he said, What went ye out in the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken to the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Did you go out to see somebody in a tailor-made suit? Mr. Copeland says he doesn't deal with people that don't dress in expensive clothes. Any preacher doesn't dress in an expensive suit and drive a brand new car. Obviously, God's not blessing him, so he's not worth talking to. Well, he wouldn't have talked to John the Baptist because he didn't have any of those things. He didn't have a donkey to wear, and he certainly didn't have a tailor-made suit. And Jesus said, did you go out to see somebody clothed in soft raiment and expensive garments? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and lived delicately are in where? King's courts. Of course, nowadays we have some people say, well, we're king's kids. Yeah, they, you might say that. You're not too particular what you say. They're certainly trying to model themselves after that, aren't they? But Jesus said, did you go see somebody like that? He said, well, don't you know, those that are all dolled up in that and specialize in special dressing are those that hang around the king's courts in the palaces. But he said, what did you go out to see? You went to see a prophet. A prophet. Does that tell you something about these modern day prophets? Jesus is kind of defrocking them, isn't he? He said, you went to see a prophet? Yea, I say to you, much more than a prophet. You went out to see somebody who was more than a prophet. You don't realize what a great man this fellow was you went to see and hear. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. He said, John the Baptist is the greatest of the prophets. But those who are born into the kingdom of God are greater than the prophets. And they have a standing that's different. All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. People said, well, praise God. I'm sure glad I got in on that baptismal service. I'm glad I went to hear him. Hallelujah. But the Pharisees and lawyers said, <laughs> see, they were wearing the soft raiment. They were living delicately. And... Uh, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. You think they submitted to baptism? I'll bet you bet they didn't. You remember the scene down by the river? And John was baptizing. And here they come, Dr. Smell Fungus and the seminary staff. They've come to check this young prophet that they've heard about. Uh, it's necessary to check all these things out against our doctrinal portfolio to see if indeed he could be, of course we don't think he is, but if he could be. We've had so many people reporting that they're going to hear him. We've got to go check him out. And you remember what happened? Now if they'd come into an ordinary meeting today, in most places, they say, oh, praise God, here comes Dr. This and Dr. That and Dr. Yonder. Uh, come on up here uh, on the platform. Brothers, we're just so happy to see you. Praise God, praise God. Here's Rabbi Duguid, and here's Father uh, Religion, and here's uh, Reverend uh, This and Reverend That. 
and Dr. This, and we're just so honored to have you in our services. Uh, you folks, little peons on the front row, you move, please, and let these dear brothers have these front seats here. We certainly want to give them a seat of honor and recognition because, after all, they possess clout in the religious world. Well, they came out to John's meeting. Of course, he wasn't meeting in a building. He was down by the riverside, and uh, there were lots of people. And here comes these sanctimonious religious folks, and all the people said, oh, look at there. Look at all the rabbis. My word. The whole bunch is here. Wow, they're coming to hear John. And they're coming very sanctimoniously, very... They're being recognized, of course. They're used to being recognized by these common people who are, of course, not as holy as they are, not as smart as they are. And John looked up. He heard the hubbub and commotion back in the back. He looked. He said, well, 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 look, a nest of rattlesnakes just dumped out in the middle of the place. Who told you rattlesnakes to come over here, you nest of vipers? Who told you to flee from the wrath to come, you unrepentant sinners? Get out of here and repent and bring forth fruit. Meet for repentance and then come to the meeting. Don't be come dragging in here your sanctimonious religious stuff. Tell you one thing, he got rid of them. They didn't have to put up with that kind of trash in his meetings. They didn't have to make room. James talks about that, you know. When the fellow with rich apparel comes, you know, you you make a big to-do over him and say, oh, sit you here. And for this little fellow who's just dressed plain, you say, oh, get out of the way, would you please? You're kind of blocking the way. Let, uh, let Mr. Rich Man sit over here. Let the lady with the diamond rings have first choice, please. Or she might hit the plate, you know, with something substantial. You don't look like you could do anything. I tell you what, James says you're sinning the sin of partiality. God isn't like that. And he looks on the heart, and the heart of the plain people who genuinely won't help is the ones God's interested and impressed with. He is not impressed. He's angry with those who are religious and all kinked up in their righteousness and come to parade their righteousness and show out and raise questions of great importance. John knew why they came. They didn't come to learn. They came to cause trouble. And he let them have it like a double barrel shotgun. He lowered the boom and blew it. He blew them right out of the water. Now, he never had read that book on how to win Jews to influence Greeks. If he had done that, he might have been a little more tactful. But since he just was led of the Holy Spirit, he blew them out of the water. Now, the Pharisees and the lawyers, of course, did not receive his baptism, and they were very insulted by all these people being impressed by what... And here's Jesus coming along and backing up this vagabond preacher that had the audacity to look right straight at Dr. Smellfungus and tell him to, he was a snake. And I'll tell you something, there's probably a deeper meaning in that business about the nest of vipers. I was talking to a Norwegian man who's been to Israel doing some research. And it's very likely that some of those higher ups, those big mucky mucks in the Pharisees and scribes were actually Luciferian worshipers. And the symbol of their worship has always been the serpent. And they were very likely snake worshipers. They were very likely secret in secret. They worshiped Lucifer. Think about it. Let it soak in for a minute. You say, is that possible? Why over in, what is it, Ezekiel? Did you ever hear the sermon on the hole in the wall? Ezekiel's hole in the wall? He peeped through the hole in the wall and he saw the elders of Israel bowing down and worshiping the symbols of Lucifer and demonic religion. No wonder it stirred such a controversy. And here's Jesus backing up the one who said, there are nests of vipers. Later on, Jesus will tell them when they get all upset with him, they'll say, we be sons of Abraham. 
We don't know who you are. We heard you were born under a cloud. Who's your father? And Jesus told them, ye are of your father, the devil. Again, tying them to Luciferian worship, religious systems that worship Satan in secret, but parade on the outside supposedly orthodoxy. It's in the world today. It's invaded into many churches. There's much witchcraft in the churches. Deliverance is the only thing strong enough to ferret it out and knock it out. As I heard somebody say, deliverance is the only place where there's so much honesty that this stuff can't survive because it has to have secret little crannies to hide in and deliverance exposes that. And if you're not willing to be open and above board, then you're never going to be able to deal with the things that are here. Well, he didn't make any points with the Pharisees and the lawyers because the very idea they had rejected John, and here he is endorsing him. And of course, the common people are endorsing it too. They will be, oh, great. He, he says John's great too. I thought he was. I'm sure glad to see hear Jesus saying he's great. <clears throat> and the Lord looked at them, that bunch of old hypocrites, religious snaggletooths, and he looks at them and he said, Where unto them shall I liken the men of this generation? To what are they like? He said, What can I think of that I can compare the men of this generation to? And notice he didn't talk about the women. He talked about the men, because if the men are rotten, it, uh, the ladies are going to be the same way. They're going to follow suit. He said, whom can I compare these rotten men of this generation to? To what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, calling one to another, saying, we've piped unto you and you've not danced. We've mourned to you and you've not wept. We played our little pipes and you wouldn't dance to our tune and we wept and you wouldn't weep with us and you just out of step. Like a bunch of little old spoiled brats. And they're not playing right. We made up the rules and they won't play by our rules. Little old pouty, petty kids. He said, that's what I like on YouTube. And you have to remember, he's talking to the doctors and the lawyers on the Sanhedrin. He's talking to men who have great stature and standing in the Jewish religious community. And he's letting them have it between the eyes and saying, you're a bunch of, like a bunch of little old petty, pouty kids. Like a bunch of little old spoiled brats. He said, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he's full of demons. He has a demon. He came fasting, wouldn't drink wine. He wouldn't eat bread. So what'd you do? You called him and you said, he's demon possessed, demon possessed. You couldn't take him. He said, I've come, the Son of Man has come, eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, friend of publicans and sinners. What's he saying? It is utterly impossible to please these demon-filled religious leaders. There is nothing you can do that will cause them to be pleased with you. You might as well quit trying. I came to that conclusion some years ago. I tried to step in within reason, within the framework of denominational lines, and all I did was got spit on, cussed, stabbed in the back, and slandered. And finally, I said, Take it and go with it. I didn't want it in the first place. You didn't call me to preach. God did. I happened to be in the Baptist church when I was called to preach, but I, the Baptist church didn't call me. And I've been a maverick ever since. I wasn't too tame before then. 
because I felt like I should preach the Bible instead of a program, and that got me into a lot of trouble. But I'll guarantee you, these boys that are program-oriented and denominational servants of whatever stripe they are, are snakes, and they will put the knife in the back of any man who stands up for what God's telling him to do. I've never seen it fail. He can have the name Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever he's got on his collar or on his door. And if he's a denominational servant, he has sold out and he will stab you to death. You're better off just to walk with Jesus and remember who called you. And Jesus said, John the Baptist came fasting and praying, wouldn't drink any wine. You said, he's crazy. He has demons. He's embarrassing. Jesus came and he ate. He sat down, was social, went to people's houses and ate and drank with them. Look at him, glutton, wine bibber. He associates with publicans and sinners. Now look us holy folks. He said, there's no satisfying you turkeys. No matter what we do or don't do, you're not going to be satisfied because we're not your bunch. And it isn't surprising. Over in 1 John, and it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, that's in one of the Gospels. Love not the world. Neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And if the world loves me, Jesus said, they'll love you. Did they love him? Then if you walk with him, will they love you? No. Never. They may tolerate you. They may be afraid of you. They may back off from you, but they're not going to love you. And the more you become like Jesus, the more the world's going to hate you. Did that stop Jesus from walking with in the will of the Father? No, and it won't stop you either. But you see, the problem is we have been taught we're supposed to conform and we're supposed to make over this old rotten society. Not so. We're supposed to save those like brands from the burning that are headed for hell and drag them to safety with prayer, with perseverance, binding and loosing, bring them to Christ. And then Christ will set them up and Christ will set them on the solid ground. We won't be doing anything except just being a worker in the vineyard. Not very glamorous, is it? You want to be a brand jerker? That's what you're supposed to be, snatching them like brands from the burning. Well, the wisdom is justified in all of our children. He said, you can say what you want to. You can criticize John the Baptist because he didn't. You can criticize me because I did. But wisdom will make the, her children to be right. Anybody with a lick of sense is going to come out with the same answer. And you have to realize, too, that religious folks are blinded in their minds and cannot see the truth. They don't want to see the truth. And delusion is a common affliction. Once you open up to delusion, you will believe anything the devil puts out. And one of the most dangerous trends of the church today is the feminization of the church, which we've been scoring in the, in the uh, workshops and will continue to do that. Because ever since things began, the devil has been trying to set a female deity at the head because he recognizes if he can do this, he will destroy the power of the church of Almighty God. Now, I believe that God wants to restore that and all of the charismatics and all of the restoration movement and the word faith movement, you've got all these women preachers, co-pastors, and invariably the woman can preach better than the man. 
It's not surprising. He's an Ahab. She ought to show him up. And let me tell you this, again, let me emphasize, no matter how many people are saved, no matter how many buildings are built under the leadership of that sister, she will get absolutely zero minus credit in heaven, and she's going to have hell on earth for it. You mark it down. Before things are over, she's going to pay a price that's much higher and when she gets to heaven, even the good that she's done will not be remembered because it's out of order. Souls will be saved, but they won't be credited to her account because she was out of order. So don't get the idea, sister, you're going around here and evangelize the world. You go ahead, but you'll sure be vacant in heaven. And I'm going to stand and look at you and say, I told you so. You'd have been better off staying Hagwish and minister. Then you could have gotten credit for heaven. You could have ministered. There were many wonderful things God could have done with you. But you ran and grabbed the reins, and that's what God didn't want you to do. And by the way, it'll kill you too. Did you know grabbing the whole the wrong thing will kill you? You say, you got scripture for that? Oh, yes, you bet. You remember when the Philistines had so much trouble with the ark. That was funny. That's a funny story. You ought to read it someday. If you, if you feel like comic stories, you know, funny stories, just real funny. The Philistines had the ark of the covenant. And of course, since it was a sacred thing, they hauled it right into their temple of Dagon, the fish god, old Leviathan, standing up there. And uh, they hauled it into the temple of Dagon, put the ark right in front of it. And the next morning, when they went in, Dagon was laying on his face right in front of the ark. And they came in, oh, what happened? My goodness, something. Well, we must have had an earthquake or something. They get busy and they, they prop him back up on there, you know. And I remember whether he took two or three dives before he broke all to pieces. Every night while they were gone, Dagon decided to bow. <clears throat> Down he went right before the ark. And they finally, you know, as dumb as they were, those heathen finally got the message. And they decided this was a terrible thing. Let's get it out of here. And they loaded it on a wagon, this big old gold box. They loaded it on a wagon. And they were scared of it. Ooh. I mean, you know, after all, their chief god, Dagon, falls on his face right in front of the thing. Wouldn't you be a little afraid to touch it? But they, they had to get it out of there. They got it out of the temple, put it on a wagon, and started back. And they notified, I believe it was notified David they could have it back. They didn't want it. And they sent to get it, you know, and they were bringing it on the wagon. And you know, that thing wasn't supposed to be carried on the wagon, was it? It was designed to be carried by the Levites on poles. Well, they had it on the wagon. And it was coming along, and everybody was jumping up and down. Hallelujah, praise God, praise God. The ark is back, the ark is back. And uh, the thing started, hit a bump or something, a rut in the road, and started, the thing started sliding off. And two young men, just as zealous and eager as they could be, shouting hallelujah, ran up to steady it, and the minute they touched it, they dropped dead. <sighs> God said, I didn't want anybody but Levites touching my box. I guarantee you nobody touched it but the Levites after that. And if it takes that in this wicked day we live in, God can strike some people dead to demonstrate what he means. And it may take an Ananias and Sapphire dropping dead because they're lying to God in the church to turn the church around. God's capable of doing that too. He's done it before, so I wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't that be exciting? I guarantee you'd walk softly. We're going into that place where that man lied to God and he dropped dead and his wife came in later. She did the same thing. She dropped dead. They had two funerals in one day. They were slain in the spirit. And they buried them. See, there's, there's a way God wants things done, the way he doesn't want it done. 
And if you do it the wrong way, he's liable to knock the stuffings out of you. He said, oh, I don't believe that. I've seen so. I don't. Just because he hadn't done it doesn't mean he can't. And you can't ever tell just because I'm preaching it, it may be opening the door for him to do something. You never know. How about that? You ever thought about what a, if somebody came up here and stood up to testify and said, I'll tell you, I've repented and a bolt of lightning fell and hit them. They knocked them on the floor. You want to pray for them? Not yet. Wait, let's stop smoking. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot of things could happen that God hadn't done yet, but he's quite capable of doing some strange and wonderful things. Of course, if that were to happen, then everybody would come rushing in to see it. Well, I don't know whether everybody would come or not. Some might decide there might be another lightning bolt in reserve might get them. But we ought to realize we're dealing with a God who's quite capable of taking drastic action to correct things when they get out of hand. Well, uh, one of the Pharisees comes in verse 36 and asks him, would you please come and eat with me? He said, all right. So he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, uh-oh, bad gal, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of ointment, stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. Remember, he's, when they ate, they reclined on a kind of a couch, like they leaned up on one elbow and ate, and they kind of stretched out on a couch behind the table. That's a pretty nice way. You know, you can take a nap while you're between courses. Anyway, that's the way they ate. And so as they were there, she came up behind him, and as his feet were out and back, she began to weep, and her tears fell on his feet. And she washed his feet with her tears. What do you suppose she's crying about? I don't know. Why did you cry when you got real close to Jesus? Why did the tears flow so? Hmm? I imagine that's why her flowed too. When she got close to him, and she began to wipe his, or wash his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hairs of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now the host is watching this disgraceful procedure. He's too polite to say anything outside, out loud. He's one of these nasty, nice folks. He thinks it, but he doesn't always say it out loud. And he saw it, and he spake within himself. He thought to himself, this is what he was thinking. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she's a sinner. He's liable to get AIDS. If this man were a prophet, he would have really known this is a bad woman, and she touched him. For she's a sinner. And he was despising Jesus. Now, he just says this inside. He didn't say it outside. And Jesus answering his thought. How embarrassing to sit at the table with Jesus when you don't have to say anything. He just answers what you're thinking. He said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Oh, uh, yes, master. Say on. Who? You know, whew, good night. Caught him thinking, you see. Um, he said, Simon, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 pence and the other owed him 50. And when he had nothing, when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, 
which of them will love him the most? The one who owed him 500 pence or the one who owed him 50? Now that may not sound like much money to us, but it was a fortune in those days. Said Simon, if the creditor forgave both of them, if he wrote the debts off and said, I'm canceling your debt for 500, I'm canceling your debt for 50. He said, which one of those creditors would love the man the most for canceling the debt? Simon said, well, I suppose to whom he forgave the most. And Jesus said, thou hast rightly judged. I just want to check to see if you knew. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, said, you see this woman? See her. He'd been horrified that she came into her house. Ooh, ooh, how did she get past the servants? Slipped up behind the master, but it's his fault for letting her handle him. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's just sitting there just having cold chills, thinking about how horrible. And if this gets out, as she came to my house, Oh, how terrible. And he said, you see this woman? She said, Simon, I came into your house as a guest. Now, you know, when your guests come then, it's customary that you offer them a basin of water, slip their sandals off, and wash their feet because their feet are dusty and sweaty from walking in the sand outside. This was customary. If you have servants, a servant did it. If you didn't have servants, the host of the house did this himself. He girded himself, took the place of servant, and did this for his guest. And he said, when I came, you didn't give me any water for my feet, but said, this woman has washed my feet with her tears. She wiped them with the hairs of her head. You were supposed to wash my feet and wipe them with a towel. You didn't. But this woman washed my feet with her tears. She wiped them with the hairs of her head. He said, thou gavest me no kiss. You didn't even greet me with a kiss. Remember Thessalonians says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss? It was customary. He said, when I came into your house, I didn't say anything, but I noticed you didn't greet me with a kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. He said, my head with oil, thou dost not anoint. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. I think by now Simon, is his chin's beginning to sag a little bit. He's getting a little draggy. Ooh, this is not too good. He's not coming out too well, is he? He was not even a good host. And yet he'd been sitting in judgment on a woman who rushed in in gratitude to show her love and gratitude to the Savior. Verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, oh, you're right, she's a sinner. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. But to, to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now let me hasten to say this. When I read this through earlier, it occurred to me, just because you haven't been forgiven much doesn't mean you don't need a lot of forgiveness. Forgiveness you must accept. And some people have accepted a little forgiveness and they need a whole lot. This woman loved much, for she had received gladly much forgiveness from the Savior. And some people, the reason they're so stingy, so proud, so arrogant, so useless to the Lord, so full of pride and pettiness, and so the reason they're so wrapped up in the things of this world, the reason they cannot get above the littleness and the pettiness of their lives, the reason they spend all their time picking other people to pieces, is because they have been forgiven very little.
You see others who go on and on and beyond the call of duty, and they just go on and they give and they give and they give. You know why? Because they have been forgiven much, much. And as you move in and begin to understand the dreadful state of your soul, the dreadful state of your mind, will, and emotion, your body, and you begin to understand what Jesus has rescued out of. And as you accept and receive more and more of his forgiving grace, this grace will transform you into a bond slave of Jesus Christ. This woman had been forgiven tons of sin because she was willing to admit she had them. See, some people can't be forgiven because they won't admit they have a sin. If they do something and cause a problem, they immediately say, it's my wife's fault. It's the preacher's fault. It's the church's fault. It's my husband's fault. They never accept blame for the things they cause themselves. Instead of saying, I was an idiot, a brainless one at that. Some of them will even get to the place where they say it with their mouth, but they don't mean it in their heart. So it still means nothing. And they are forgiven little. And therefore they love little. That's why they have little love. Now in the light of that, do you understand why I don't get so upset with some people who have such a teeny little speck of love that they're constantly in a stir of jealousy and about other people? Because I know what's the matter. They need great forgiveness. They need great grace in their life. But instead of that, they have stopped short and said, I have all I need now. It's my turn to sit around and I'll decide about everybody else now. Whereas if they have received great grace and great forgiveness, they have a tendency to want to reach out and help those who honestly are struggling to get free from sin. It makes the difference, as the old saying goes, between the men and the boys, between the women and the gals. It makes a difference because those who have experienced much of the grace of God will have much grace to reach out to others with. And they're the ones who are going to make a mark for Jesus. And you know, those who have small forgiveness, small, well, it didn't take months for God to get me, you know. After all, I was well nigh perfect before he got me. Little twist, a little tune up here and there is all it took to get me straightened out. Those kind of people never get far with God, while the others are doing all kinds of wonderful things for the Lord. Why? Because they pull out all the stops and say, Lord, you love me so much, the, best, the only way I can show you how grateful I am is to try to turn around and love somebody else and try to reach out to them and help them. Those who love little have been forgiven little. Not because they don't need to be forgiven, but because they won't receive it. Remember that. The faucet's on your side. How much grace do you want in your life? You say, well, I'm trying and trying to get grace. And I just go in there and I sit there with that little old cup under there and just goes drip, drip, drip. It just takes forever to get even a swallow grace. Hey, I got news for you. You see that thing on top? You twist that thing. The control is on your side of the fence. The lines are full. The grace of God faileth not. It's up to you to open the spigot wide, and you better jump for your life, because if you open it wide enough, it'll splash all over you. There's that much grace in there. I mean, there's great power and pressure of the grace of God to come forth. You and I control how much of the grace of God will come into our lives. And the amount of grace that comes into our lives through forgiveness, and that's how you get it. You'll never be gracious until you've been forgiven. You'll never be forgiven until you admit it, that you need it. You can't walk around being proud and blaming everybody else. You've got to admit from the depths of your soul, I am guilty, it's my fault and nobody else's.
And down deep inside, you'll find something saying, no, it isn't. It really isn't your fault. You shouldn't feel so bad about it because everybody does that. Well, then you've got to go down in there and bore that thing out and get rid of that until you can say with all your soul, I know it's my fault, Lord. Please forgive me. And then the grace of God will come just like a gully washer through there. And when the grace of God comes through you, that equips you to reach out to others who are desperately struggling for help. Those who have been forgiven most will experience most of the grace of God. And there's no use in you getting jealous of somebody else who's full of grace and graciousness and who's able to be used of God. It won't do you a bit of good to get all upset about it because the way you get there is to receive that unbelievable, as one of my Bible teachers used to say, the abounding, astounding, amazing grace of God. The most amazing thing in the world is the grace of God. And by receiving this through forgiveness, it equips you to turn around and be a blessing to the people around you. Now, Jesus said, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. Verse 47. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Little love, little forgiveness. Not because it's not needed, but because it has not been received. Now, this will help you to understand people who are in among you, who somehow they just never can get above a certain level in their Christian life. They never can get moving. It's because they have not been forgiven. Not because God won't do it, but because they're too proud, too arrogant to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. When they do that, he will graciously forgive them. And then they will be able to turn loose great torrents of love toward the one who has forgiven them. Don't hesitate to be honest with the Lord. You cannot lose. You'll lose a great deal. And he's telling Simon, you have been forgiven little. She was forgiven much. She loves the most because she knows what has happened. He looks at her and says, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sin also? Uh-oh, we're off on a religious merry-go-round. Here we go. Whoopee. Uh, how does he get off this forgiving sin? Who told him he could do that? Well, his father, for one. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. The Holy Spirit drew her, convicted her. She wept, and her actions were a, an offering to him of the contrition of her heart, of her repentance. We are not re it's not recorded. She said a word, but she demonstrated her repentance, and Jesus forgave her. And she became a very wonderful example of what can happen. Now, you can be a trickle or a river. It depends on what you want to do. But don't sit around and gripe because your cup's still dripping. He says it's been dripping for two days and it's still not full. I'd suggest you check and see if God can't forgive you some things that you haven't dealt with yet. Dig deep. Oh, I don't mean you have to make up something. <laughs> yeah, you've got enough in reserve. I don't think you have to make up anything. I think you <laughs> you just be honest with the Lord. He'll unearth a few things that you've overlooked, uh, you know, conveniently and sweetly and nicely. But if you'll start being completely honest with the Lord, you'll be surprised how the fountain of grace will open up. And as grace comes flowing out, and as you begin to appreciate what God has done for you, and His grace begins to motivate and move you, you're going you're gonna to flow with the Lord. And this will be an individual thing. It won't be something you'll run around and brag and bray about to the housetops. It'll be something that'll change your life, change your outlook, change your attitude, change the way you work, change the way you live, and it'll change every day. 
I say it's worth looking into it. And how do we do this? Well, it's right up here on the wall. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's like soap. You need to use it every day. You say somebody said, well, I used it last week. Were you ever around somebody who used soap last week? You can tell it too, can't you? There's a need for a refreshing. Soap is like 1 John 1, 9. It needs to be applied as often as necessary. I'll let you decide when to apply it. But if people come around you and they begin to go, shh, 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 shh. if they're beginning to pick up spiritual sense, it may be that you need a little more often. 